Okay, um, let's get this started. Um, first and foremost, to get the, the um, voices out of my head that come through this wall. Um, not used to that. Um, so thank you that you're all here. Um, uh, you're the best audience uh, today, um, obviously, at least for me. Uh, so um, uh, this uh, talk is titled How to Improve uh, Your Project's uh, Accessibility Without Going Crazy. Um, and the slides are up there, um, which is quite, quite interesting. Uh, never got this wall thing before. Um, but obviously, coming from Germany, we got a lot of experience with walls. Um, that aside, <laughs> that aside, um, uh, I have a little prelude um, made, up, made up for you, so a little bit of context. Um, so that's my name, Eric Eggert, um, and I'm uh, at, working at W3C, um, at the Web Accessibility Initiative, um, this is the W3C logo, um, and most of you might know W3C. Hands up, who does? Awesome. Um, who knows the Web Accessibility Initiative? Okay, almost as much. We brought you um, things like HTML5, and of course, cascading style sheets, CSS. Ooh, exciting. Um, the W3C invented media queries in 2001, um, six years before the iPhone. So there's a lot of history there, a lot of stuff. Um, and most people know about accessibility from those little guys that are floating through the air, um, accessibility icons. Um, just one, one first shot. If your website really is accessible, you can still use them. Um, but you shouldn't, really. Um, so that just as a bit of context, where well, you might have seen W3C stuff um, on the internet. Uh, but now to the real meat of the talk. Um, accessibility is a topic. Um, many people know they must do it. Um, but what I often see when I get to people and say, oh, let talk about accessibility, basically this happens, and they just go back and say, oh, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Um, yeah, and it's really, that's how it is. Um, they just vanish. But it is an important uh, topic, um, and um, if you know this guy, that's Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web. Um, Here's, uh, this was in 2012 at the Olympic Games. Um, he uh, twittered um, from the Olympic Stadium in London um, to the world. It looked a bit like this. Um, and what did he tweet? Um, his gift to the world, the, the World Wide Web, this is for everyone. Um, it was displayed large in the stadium, but of course it was a, a well-timed tweet back then. Um, with a lot of hashtags and ad replies because that's how, how you roll, but you don't have that many, much space in a stadium. Um, that means if the web is really for everyone, it needs to be accessible for everyone. Um, if you go to w3c.org slash accessibility, it says the web is fundamentally designed to work for all people, whatever their hardware, software, language, culture, location, physical or mental ability. When the web meets this goal, it is accessible to people with a diverse range of hearing, movement, sight, and cognitive abilities. So it's really very broad. It's not like... The 80%, it's everyone. Um, and for me, accessibility is always like, make sure that people with disabilities in particular can effectively and efficiently interact with the web. Um, uh, so accessibility is like a subsection of usability. It has just a very narrow focus to do some things differently. Um, and there's a lot of responsibility involved in making websites. Um, on the web, every decision I make can have a profound effect on hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people's lives. 
I can make a check-in into a flight a breeze, or I can make it a living hell. Uh, that's uh, Aaron Gustafson um, in a foreword to a book, and that's a lot of power, he says, or he writes, uh, and to quote Stanley, who used that sentence uh, in Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Now, it is a great responsibility. We affect the life of so many people. And I needed to check in into my flight tomorrow, um, actually the, in the last session. And it was quick and easy, and it was a good experience, and I really enjoyed that. Um, and we shouldn't just get things in the way of people who want to use our stuff. Um, and to think about the dimensions uh, one billion persons with some form of disabilities are on this very planet. That are 15% of all people who have a disability. This means here we need, or uh, we would probably have like five people with disability in this audience. That should be, should be all right. Um, and then above that, that's um, WHO, a World Health Organization data, by the way. And above that, there are different situations, um, like if you have a broken arm um, or if you're carrying something, probably a baby, you, you can't use that arm very effectively. It is like a situational uh, disability. Um, so you've got disabilities, uh, impairments, and then the situations where you're just not... Um, where it's just not possible to use every ability that you might have. Um, and now there are certain questions that people ask me. Well, I, I have to force them to ask me the questions because they vanish back into the edge. But one of the questions is, how do people with disabilities use the web? Because most people just don't know, um, which is no surprise. So... Who here has seen uh, someone with a screen reader interacting with the web? Okay, a few people. Uh, who has seen someone with a mouth mouse interacting with the web? Two people. You know, it's getting narrower and narrower. Um, who has seen uh, people using captions on the web? Like in videos, captioning and subtitling. I think we all have. Um, so... The, usually we think about accessibility, uh, uh, people using the web um, in those two simple ways. So they look at a browser and that browser looks into the internet and then the browser displays the internet to the user and the user reads from the screen um, uh, and interprets that information uh, by themselves. Now, when uh, disabilities are involved, um, another layer is introduced. It's called accessible, assistive technologies. Assistive technologies help the user interact with the whole computer or smartphone uh, or, or a tablet. Um, and then they are, those assistive technologies translate to the browser and they translate to the web. So there is another layer. Um, here are a few of those assistive technologies. Some are more known and some are less known. Um, this, for example, is a normal desktop, uh, but some people use it like this. Or like this, or like this, or like this, or like this. And this can be on a 27-inch monitor, on a display that is really large, but they need that size of text on that monitor to do anything, um, just to put that into perspective. So who has used Zoom on any of their devices? I did. Some people do. Uh, because this is Zoom as well. Pinching, pinch to Zoom, basic accessibility. Now we're all using it, um, although we don't have any special needs. Um, this is a keyboard, or the icon of a keyboard. Um, keyboard access is crucially important for accessibility. Because if you have dexterity issues, so uh, Parkinson's disease, for example, you just can't use the mouse properly. It just doesn't, you, you can't target um, well. That's impossible. But you can use the keyboard and, uh, and have a pretty good success rate with that. So um, having keyboards in there is really important for accessibility. This is a Braille keyboard, um, basically the same 
approach with the normal conventional keyboard, but you got that braille, um, that line of braille, which uh, you can read with your fingers, um, and then you got the buttons on the top uh, and those two on the bottom edge, and those are for typing in braille. So um, a blind person can basically have their hands uh, on this device and use their phone or their computer with that um, without taking the hands off. It's actually pretty remarkable technology. Um, so there's a lot of things there. And one thing that's often forgotten is customizations. Um, whoops. Here we are. Customizations. Um, here, for example, you can edit the font and the default font size for your for, for your um, web browser. This is built in into the web browser, not into the operating system. This is a web browser specific thing. And you can say, oh, by default, I want my font size to be 25 pixels high. And it will work because we are now used to using EMs in our layouts or even REMs. Um, and with those, it will work just fine. If you use pixels, you might be out of luck if, if, you're, if you need um, a, f a font in that size. Then you can say, oh, but I, I can't do that with those silly fonts like I'm using here. They're hard to read for me. Um, I want to specify my own fonts because I'm dyslexic. Uh, and I got a special font that, for me, reads very well. Um, there are several of those. Um, and then you can just specify that as my sans serif, as my serif font, um, and that will override whatever you specified as a web developer. Um, which most designers doesn't, which most designers are very, um, don't like that, um, that's for sure. But that's how it is. Um, and then there is this, oh no, I've skipped one. Uh, da, 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 da. And then on this edge, you got that small, it's, it's minimum font size. Uh, and then there you can uh, have all font sizes basically uh, render void and, and not important at all. If you set minimum font size to 20 pixels and you got um, a heading of 18 pixels and a body's text of 16 pixels, they will both be 20 pixels high. So there's, you can't distinguish between headings and, and base text anymore. Uh, so the user has so much control and can also um, enter uh, colors and stuff um, and really, yeah, make your site very, very ugly, um, but working for them. Um, balloon special effects. Um, <laughs> then there's uh, also captions. I spoke about them before. Um, this is, uh, again, Tim Berners-Lee. He's introducing web platform docs. And um, he's quoted, uh, uh, his job title here is web developer, which is technically true, technically. Um, so, uh, yeah, captions. So a lot of different assistive technology that um, helps people use the web, access the content. Um, and now you want to read more about this, I hope. Um, and W3C has content about this. It's called How People with Disabilities Use the Web. Pretty obvious title. Uh, it's on w3.org slash way slash intro slash people use web with dashes between them. Um, and, uh, and there are personas there that you can use in your projects, in your project proposals. Um, so you can integrate that from the from the ground up into how you approach a web project. Um, and that's really, really neat. Um, another question that I often get. Accessibility sounds complicated. I hear that every time. And I got two problems with that. The first problem is, this is not a question. Um, the second problem is, it's the wrong question to ask, even if you wanted to, uh, because everything we do is complicated. Um, if we do uh, JavaScript, that's complicated. Implementing and designing a slider, it's complicated. There are so many complicated things. Accessibility is just another thing, not another complicated thing. And it's not complica more complicated than anything else. What you really want to ask is, how do I start with web accessibility? So where, where do I begin? Um, I'm standing here, I know nothing about that. 
give me, give me some quick things that I can use. Um, and uh, especially that's important for designers and content creators and developers because they need to work together um, on all those issues that are there and that need to be accessible. Um, and surprise, W3C has something for you. Um, it's called the Getting Started Tips for Web Accessibility. Sorry, it's called Tips for Getting Started with Web Accessibility. Another one of the bloody obvious uh, documents. Um, and we got three uh, of those tips out there uh, for designing, writing, and developing. Those are actually pages with a lot of single small tips to read, to think about, um, and to understand. This, for example, is one of the writing section. Now, writing is important because we got things like alternative text. And if you, uh, and if you look at uh, the left side, uh, on both sides, actually, um, it shows a mobile phone that is plugged into the wall. And the, the only thing that is missing is that, um, uh, what the image shows, is that you plug in the loading cable to the bottom edge of the phone. On the right, um, uh, on the left side, uh, right from me, um, left side it says uh, charging phone, which isn't very informative. On the left it says the cable has to go to the bottom edge of the phone. This is the content creator specifying that. It's not like, oh, uh, I'm the web developer, I'm creating this website, uh, and there comes an image, and now what, is, what do I see there? Oh, it's a charging phone, obviously. No, it's not. We need writers to do this. Um, and this is one of the, of the um, many examples on there. Um, I've picked a few uh, to go through. Um, what you always have here is um, WCAG. I get to that uh, in a moment. Uh, uh, requirements and uh, tutorials and other stuff, like um, things where you can learn more about. And there are also links to um, how people with disabilities use the web. So it's all interlinked from there. Um, can only recommend that as a starting point. Um, this is another one of those tips. Um, it is use headings and spacing to group related content. Um, really obvious, actually. Um, as a designer, developer, you probably say, yeah, I use headings, and uh, it's pretty obvious. Um, but it has a profound impact on the scannability of your page, on the readability of the page, um, and how people can understand that. Um, so we got that in there for designers, for example. Uh, and then there is that conspiracy, um, and I don't know where it comes from. It must be some Illuminati stuff, I'm not sure. It is, it is designers are pretty sure that gray text on white background is the only acceptable color for text. It is everywhere, and it's like, no, it's not, at least not that shade of gray that no one can, can read. I have heard there are 50 shades of gray, but I could be mistaken. At least not, don't use a, a gray that is not readable in sunlight or, or anyhow. Um, use a darker gray. Whoa. And then there are things for, who are even more developer-focused, like this one, um, it's using media queries to adapt to the um, tool or to the, to the thing that the user actually uses. So uh, in that case, it renders the page differently when it's on a small screen. But it's not only a small screen. It's also when the user has zoomed in in the browser. It can also change the view to make it more linear so the user doesn't have to scroll around. The resource for this is Tips for Getting Started with Web Accessibility. I said that before. It's at w3.org slash way slash getting started slash tips. Um, and uh, you, can, you can access them now. And, uh, and there are a lot of tips. I think it's, it's 12 per category or something like that. Um, really small things. But if you keep them in mind, you have a much better website. And if you say, oh, that's so obvious. I ever did that. There is more that you can read on and, uh, and just understand and grasp more of, of the accessibility things. So how do I sh make sure that my website is accessible? Another one of those 
inevitable question. Well, I don't know how you can say that your website is quote-unquote accessible because that's a very broad range of people who need to use your website without anything uh, uh, disturbing them. But you can make them conform to a W3C standard called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0. Uh, or as I will call them from now on, WCAG, because Web Content Accessibility Guidelines is very long. So um, they are at w3.org slash tr slash WCAG, um, and it contains f uh, out of four principles uh, that need to be met to make sure that your website is um, accessible. And that's perceivable, operable, um, understandable, and robust. Those four main principles are there. Uh, and I have a few examples out of those um, principles. Those are not all examples uh, that we have in there, but um, some of the broader ones. Um, perceivable text alternatives. So if you got an image um, like this, this is actually a button with a, a pen on it, um, a pencil on it, um, this, your code might look like this. So you as a person using your eyes to perceive content, you say, yeah, of course it's an edit button. I can see that my brain makes the connection uh, because a pencil button, it, it would be great if you click on it and a pencil comes out of your computer, but it do usually doesn't, so it's, it's an edit button. Um, and this could be your code, and then you go and have a screen reader uh, which blind people use to access content. Um, and you get this. Button. And it says just button when you get to this element. This is not very useful because you might have other buttons there as well, like bold and italic and stuff like that. And if they're all button, 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 it's not very descriptive. Now, the same button which is actually not the same button because I've changed something in the code. I've added a title, um, which is a quick fix here, but, um, but just go with it. Uh, it's not the best thing to do. Um, and then it sounds like this. Edit button. Edit button. Much better, much better, because now you know it's an edit button. The button actually comes from the button element. So the screen reader is not only reading what's in, in the code, uh, it's, it's reading not only what's in the element, but also what the element is and announces that. Um, and that's important to keep in mind. So don't use a span as a button um, and use JavaScript and, and, and shit to, to do that. Shouldn't say that. Um, that's Morton's influence, you know. It's when, when Morton is around, it's uh, not good. So, um, yeah, use a button element if you want to, you, to have a button. Don't use uh, an anchor element, an A element, just use a button. So, that's great, but now we have that, um, that icon, and that actually is, um, is an icon font. Okay, well, now I'm sitting in the, in, in the train um, and just access your website and it looks like this. You edit button. It, now it is perceivable um, with the screen reader. Oops, that was too fast. Now it is perceivable um, by a screen reader. Screen reader can access that and it would say edit button. Um, but actually, no one who can see can access this which is an accessibility problem as well. Um, so that's not really useful. Um, and I, I, one of the best examples is with GitHub. Um, when you access um, a repository there, you get this nice buttons and the side menu and stuff like that, but if the icon font isn't loading or is content blocked, like on new versions of popular Apple devices, um, it looks like this, and you see nothing at all. Because um, in contrast to the thing we had f before where there was a placeholder image, um, this is Chrome and Safari not doing that. Firefox is having a placeholder image. Chrome and Safari just don't show anything if they don't have that character. So that means you even don't know where to put your finger and, and just try out, um, which is pretty bad. We don't want that. So what about using images uh, in there? 
that's actually cool because we now got a button and an image, and that image can have an alternative text. That's cool, but now it's in PNG and it doesn't scale that well and stuff like that. Oh. So we use an SVG. Case closed. Wonderful. This will work. It will say edit button. Everything is fine. Um, you can read more about this in the images tutorial. Um, it's at w3.org slash way slash tutorial slash images. There's a vast thing about images. It's, uh, it's really a lot to, to see with a lot of examples, a lot of small stuff, a lot of, um, uh, of things where you can really dive in and get into the nuances of when to use which alternative text, like you use edit instead of pencil here. Um, and um, this is a part, and this is an, a bit of an aside, this is part of a larger resource that's called the Web Accessibility Tutorials um, that you find at um, w3.org slash way slash tutorials. Um, pretty obvious. Um, and we got six of those. Three are completed images, tables, and forms. And three are in an advanced state, but there needs to be some more work done. So they are in draft status. Um, and those are page structure, menus, and carousels. Um, and you can read them, and those are more uh, aimed at developers who really want to dive in. Um, and there's a lot of uh, nice HTML that you can now use with your new fancy Twig templates. Um, just, I, I need to say that for, because of Morton. Um, but another solution for this whole problem is just having visual text labels, visible text labels. Um, like this, there's edit in the button. This might not always be preferable, um, but it's actually a good solution. Because you got the edit in there, you can use your icon font if you want to. Uh, you can also use SVG, of course, uh, with SVG use and all those fancy polyfills that you young kids use. Um, and um, this is all possible because now you got a dedicated uh, text in there. Edit button. I love when, when it says that. Um, and, of course, that's really slow. If you see a blind person using a screen reader, it goes like... And you think it's really, really weird that they can understand that because they're just so used to it um, and getting those commands out of there. Um, really interesting. So that's basically the most universal thing you can do. Just use text and say, okay, and everything else is optional. Um, a bit of progressive enhancement. Now there's a perceivable um, color contrast. I said that before, the Illuminati thing um, of, uh, of colors. Uh, just make sure you're using colors that have a good contrast. You can Google for color contrast tools. Um, basically, if it is uh, less than 4.5 to 1, it is not good. It's not really readable, and you should aim for that. Um, operable. Uh, the principle has you, you, it should be usable with the keyboard. It has things like having proper headings and labels. So if you've got an input field, there is a label element in HTML5. You should just use that label element to connect those two because then a screen reader who approaches that can say what this input field actually is instead of just input field, basically the same with the button, button exp uh, thing. Um, Understandable, set the page language. So if you're, if you're having um, a French screen reader user who uses his screen reader in French and uh, who accesses a website in English and you don't have specified lang equals uh, en on the top of the page, the screen reader will read everything as uh, pronounced in French. This is not a nice experience because you can't understand anything. Um, so you should really think about that uh, and just add lang equals de or en or fr if you're in French, uh, if you're in France, um, and add that to your HTML on the beginning, and basically you're done. Um, there's still something to do to add additional lang attributes to elements that have, um, that have text in other languages there, but you're covered for, for the most part. 
uh, and it's especially important on multilingual page pages and websites. Um, understandable says have a cons consistent navigation. Again, this is nothing very specific for accessibility, but it improves the life for people who are using um, tools like uh, like screen readers and stuff much more than for the average user. Um, don't jump from one category to another without announcing it somehow. Um, it's just it's just good user experience um, that comes in here. Um, and the third or the last one the fourth one actually, is robust, and that's all about compatibility. So use, use the most fancy thing you have, but always think about what is the fallback if it breaks. If I use a JavaScript carousel, if the JavaScript breaks, do I have like um, absolute positioned elements all over the page and nobody can interact with them because I have hidden them with a JavaScript as, script as well? Um, that's not a best practice. And... Um, the same is with uh, like custom controls. You probably want to have a native control as a fallback and also have that for the screen reader users to access. Um, and that's now going to the part of this talk where I do um, awkward pause because I need to drink something. Ah. Thank you for holding out. Um, and where we come to um, to the back end part, because you're all doing the true world stuff, there are probably a lot of site builders in here. Who is a site builder? Yes, some who do some site building, uh, but this is for your site building friends. <laughs> and probably, as Morton said yesterday, you don't need them anymore anyway because you're now using Twig. Um, so. Um, how do, do I make sure that my uh, web backend is accessible? So there is a relatively new uh, standard that's called the Authoring Tools Accessibility Guidelines, or ATAC um, 2.0. Um, that, um, that came out a few weeks ago um, and is now ready and done. And um, it consists of two parts, because it's always good to have more complexity, right? Um, Part A is make the authoring tool user interface accessible so that people who have a disability can actually use your authoring tool. But there's a second part of, of it, and that's support the production of accessible content. Um, and I will come back to what this actually means. So part A, make the authoring tool user interface accessible. Um, has principles like this, authoring tool user interfaces follow ex applicable accessibility guidelines. Basically, that means if your authoring tool, which is a CMS, it could be like a social media site where you put content in. Everything where the user puts in content is called an authoring tool in W3C lingo. So just to make that clear. So... Um, so Twitter, for example, has, is, has an authoring tool component to it. Um, so follow ex, uh, applicable accessibility guidelines. If you do something for the web, that means following WCAG for your backend as well. Um, with having languages and stuff like that. It's basically the same all over again. You just say, in PHP, you say import WCAG, and then WCAG is in there, and you just use that. Um, if you do an iPhone um, app or an Android app on Microsoft phone, Windows phone app, um, you need to use to, to follow their guidelines for accessible interfaces. Um, the second principle is editing views are perceivable. So you're editing buttons, need text alternatives. Um, uh, if there is an error, for example, if you have spell checking in there, um, those need to be programmatically conveyed to users, so you can't just have them in there and not not um, uh, accessible to people. Um, the editing views are operable, um, so people actually can edit stuff. That's pretty obvious. Um, uh, so that means in details providing keyboard access to authoring features. Um, that means shortcuts, you can provide them, or you can 
uh, for example, allow users to customize keyboard access um, or to present the keyboard commands, like an overview for shortcuts. If you hit the question mark in, in, in popular web apps, they will have an overview where you see all the shortcuts. Um, those are not things you must do, but you can do. It's AAA. There are three layers of the cake, basically. Um, a is the absolute minimum you should do, and then there's double A and uh, AAA. And we usually recommend to at least try to achieve double A because it's, it's like where you get the most, uh, the most bang for your buck, really. Um, uh, provide authors with enough time. Don't make it just time out ran seemingly randomly. If you need to have a time limit, like, in, uh, uh, like if you have an online banking thing uh, or payment thing in, in your web shop, um, you just uh, need to make sure that they can extend the limit. Um, this might sometimes not be possible. For example, if you think about tickets to uh, popular concerts, they have like 15 minutes things. Um, and if you haven't finished your, your order, then uh, the tickets are gone. Um, but you should really let the user turn it off or at least um, extend the, um, the time uh, and say, hey, uh, do you really want to, to continue? Then click this button uh, and we take care uh, about, uh, of this and you get another five minutes. Um, enhance navigation and editing via content structure. Um, basically the same thing as in, in, in the front end stuff. Just make sure that it's logical, that there are headings, that there are distinct pages for the websites, that the navigation is good. Um, make sure that the editing views are understandable. Um, help authors to avoid and correct mistakes uh, is meant by that. So um, if you detect a mistake, for example, a missing alternative text on an image, stuff like that, um, you just flag that as an important thing and the authors can correct that. Um, also, edits should be reversible, so you should provide an edit function in your, in your CMS, um, and I'm pretty sure Drupal has that covered. Um, uh, and you should document the user interface, including all accessibility features. So just make sure that people can understand that, can read um, a bit of documentation about it. You can also have this inline as tooltips and stuff like that. I know that Drupal provides um, possibilities to better or, or uh, yeah, better describe fields. So use that um, and just be more clear on what should be uh, put in there. Um, but the more exciting part, at least for me, is to support the production of accessible content. Because let's face it, um, in the end, users will use your CMS um, and use the back end of your CMS. Um, and they will produce content, and they should, th that content needs to be accessible because it's reaching far more people than using, uh, uh, using just the back end of, of your small CMS solution for, for this. So, um, so part B is a bit more exciting. Part A is much more important if you really want to use it. But uh, part B is exciting and more new. Uh, so um, B1, principle B1, is fully automatic processes produce accessible content. So when the user is doing nothing, the, the content writer is doing nothing, it should be a, stay uh, accessible. So that means if there's a heading field, what comes out in the front end is actually a heading. It sounds pretty basic but I've seen that done wrong so often. Um, and um, also accessibility features that the author puts into the, um, the code stay in there. For example, if there's an alternative text and the user can specify that, the, the, the CMS uh, editor can specify that, this actually is conveyed and is uh, on the front end as well. Um, because it's quite important that uh, this is done and not just discarded along the way. Um, B2, authors are supported in producing accessible content. That means the authoring tools could uh, 
does not restrict that wicker compliant content can be created. Um, instead, it just supports the author, uh, give guidance, uh, provide fields, says here, put this in, make sure that this is checked, uh, small things. Um, this is just an important thing. Uh, also, if you think about tables uh, and putting in tables into CMSs, it's, it's a, really a mess. Um, and, uh, and producing accessible tables, um, uh, editors, people who use CMS stuff, they need to, um, to be aware that table headings, for example, are important. Um, B23 says, assist authors with managing alternative content for non-text content. That's exactly what I meant. Provide a text field for alternative text. Make it required. Um, and I know Drupal has done this in Drupal 8. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, just make sure that if there's something needed for accessibility, that the author not only has this provided, but um, is forced to provide it as well. Um, assist authors with, with accessible templates, that's basically a no-brainer. If your website conforms to WCAG, you're done. Um, but you should, you should really make sure that everything that the author can do is uh, done in a way so that the content that comes out of the template is accessible. Authors are supported in improving the accessibility of existing content. So, for example, you are now going home to your uh, site builders people and you say, oh, we sh really should have an alternative text field for this image. Um, and our site is in Drupal 7, so we didn't have it from the beginning. Um, then you just tell them, okay, implement that and just flag every article where this field is not set so people can actually go back, take a look, um, and make sure that this content is, is accessible. Um, in some cases, that's just not feasible because you've got tens of thousands um, of documents uh, online. Um, but at least you could assist authors uh, if it's done. That's uh, another question and probably not worth uh, adding uh, alternative text to press releases that are uh, obsolete since 10 years. Um, Assist authors in checking for accessibility problem. Now, of course, the author, you as a, as a de developers, um, can do only so much. Um, we know that authors who create um, the web content, they always break stuff because they just want to find workarounds for some things. Um, so what you can do is have basic accessibility checking in your, in your back end um, that helps the author to decide um, what to do, um, how to do wicked compile and editing, um, and make sure that a status report is available so that people can, that you can make um, checkups regularly. As is authors in repairing accessibility problems, so if there's a preferred solution, if you can do anything that helps, do it. Um, authoring tools promote and integrate their accessibility features. Um, so Drupal has an accessibility statement, um, and uh, as we see with um, the alternative text field, um, it really makes clear that accessibility is an important goal, um, and I think it's quite good facilitated, but you can do more in text and stuff um, in, in the back end when you build it. So that was a lot of technical stuff and reading um, specifications, W3C specifications, that's really hard. Um, so I tried to translate at least a bit of those uh, for you. Um, but there are still questions that are coming up. So um, how do I make sure that the experience is accessible using the system um, using my website, both things working together pretty good, um, that it's just a pleasure to use it. Um, so you achieve the best results in the following uh, context. Uh, when accessibility is not an afterthought. You just can't make a good product if you think about accessibility 
afterwards. You have to think about it from the beginning. That's why we have the personas. That's why we have how people with disabilities use the web. That's why the quick tips are here. Everyone can do at least a little bit, and it's not on the developers on, the, on one hand or on the designers or on content writers, but everything. It needs to be a team effort to do that. Um, and this having accessibility not as an afterthought, that has ramifications for your CMS and for, for your website. Your website and the back end is easy to use. It's much easier to, to just do stuff and build stuff and, and create things because it's keyboard accessible and some users might prefer that um, uh, or they, they got rid uh, of the fiddly drag and drop interface that never worked quite right um, and now it's just... Uh, just using the keyboard um, with some shortcuts um, that can help a lot of people. You don't need to rebuild when uh, you're, you need to make your website accessible, for example, if the law changes. Um, and here in Austria, every website who, uh, who is aimed at consumers needs to be accessible. So there's no way around that. Um, no need to rebuild if you think about hiring people with disabilities to interact with your CMS. They must be accessible because else you can't uh, get those. You need to see accessibility as an opportunity, as an opportunity to reach more people, to really get to those, get this out, bring your product that hopefully is something good, to, uh, to the, add something good to the world, to reach more of them, to make your campaign, your thing more successful. Um, it makes your website easier to understand as well, um, as I have said. It makes your layout and your navigation consistent, um, which will make your users very happy, um, and which is also very important, and which can drive um, adop adoption of your website. Um, another thing that helps you to really achieve a good experience is to use accessibility as a, creat as a creative outlet. Um, for example, one thing that you can do is create the best video player UI. Um, and there is a blog post from the BBC from uh, Henny Swan. Um, what they did to improve the experience uh, with their um, web player is that once you now navigate through closed captions um, and get to a list of... Um, of things, of, uh, of videos to watch, and you click on play, those closed captions are automatically switched on. It's a small thing to do, really, but it improves the, access the accessibility and, of course, the experience so much because now you don't need to think, oh, I've clicked on those, this uh, closed caption thing and nothing happens, oh, and I need to search for the icon and stuff like that. It's just there. And you should take the available data and do something that no one expects. The following clip is from uh, the last Apple keynote. Um, they introduced the Apple TV, um, and then they did this. Uh, the year was 1991. And America for those times when I just missed what was said, uh, 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 what did she say? Siri will skip back 15 oh. seconds and temporarily turn on the captions. <laughs> so cool. So in this case, um, just because captions are there, which is an accessibility feature, voice input is there, which is an accessibility feature, um, there is a remote in her hand, which is an accessibility feature. Uh, because it was invented in the U.S. because there were soldiers coming back from war that couldn't go to the, to the TV and switch channels. So those are basically three accessibility things that now help everyone. Um, and you just display the captions because they're there and it's a good use. Um, and sometimes you just come across things you don't uh, understand. And that's everything I got. Um, my name is Eric Eggert. Um, it's w 3 c uh, web Accessibility Initiative. Uh, my um, email address, if you've got anything uh, interesting to say, is double e at w3.org. Um, and you find me as Yatil on all the social networks. And uh, so you don't need to ask me about my fonts. Um, I put them in there. Uh, so, um, yeah. 
Thank you to all the great font designers and thank you for listening to my talk. And if you have questions, just ask them now or later. Go ahead. This is a question that requires a very complicated answer, uh, which then boils down to you can't, <laughs> because there are um, a lot of different um, needs for people. So there is not that uniform font. There is the saying that um, some serif fonts with, uh, with no serifs, that they work better for most people with disabilities and in general for most people, but then there are other studies who say the exact opposite. What you can do is just um, have a look and see that there are no, um, no letters that are too similar, like a small L and a large I, things like that. Like in Helvetica, it's a, it's a common thing. Um, often it, it is said that um, too geometric stuff is hard to, harder to read, um, but actually there is not that one font that will work. Thank you. Other questions? Um, how reliable is tool support? Um, can I use a set of tools and then I can say, okay, my site is probably uh, pretty accessible? Yes, you can uh, use tools. We got a website on w3c.org, which is called the Web Accessibility Tools, Web Evaluation Tools List. Sorry. Um, and uh, that has a list of, of tools that you can use. Just be aware that you can't test everything um, using, uh, using automatic tests. Um, because, for example, with the alternative text, you can detect if the alternative text is missing and say, oh, this is wrong. But then there are images who don't require an alternative text and where it is empty. Um, but that's okay, and then you get images which have an alternative text, but it's the wrong one. Um, so it's hard to do that um, using, using tools, but at least they can flag up um, uh, certain things uh, and, and uh, help. And there's a long list on the W3C side. I think we have um, about 100 tools on there. Um, and uh, there are uh, browser plugins and uh, everything. So... More questions? I think we can take another one, if you have one. Go ahead. Okay, the, the personal from before doing W3C stuff, um, I worked uh, in client work, um, and I used Drupal for two projects, I think, so I don't have a lot of experience. But the, um, the missing ability to really control source code, that was basically the, the, the greatest obstacle, that it was incredibly hard to, to get the code like I wanted. Now, I'm probably very particular with my code needs, but, um, but I found that quite hard. Um, else, I was pretty pleased with how, how it worked out uh, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, some things like alternative text fields for images and, and stuff like that. Pardon? Yes, yes. Uh, I, th I think it's it's very uh, it's it's quite accessible. Um, I didn't do any specific testing, uh, but uh, but I haven't heard any complaints. <laughs> yeah. Now with with uh, the ATEX stuff, you can really have a list of stuff you want to achieve and and test them against those crit criteria. Um, and I. Th I think there have been Drupal people involved in the, uh, in the ATAC work, but I'm not really sure um, if that was like from companies who are using Drupal, but not really Drupal, Drupal people. Um, I don't know because I wasn't that involved, but, uh, but I think there was some, um, some things going on there. Okay, thank you very much. And if you've got any further questions, um, I'm around the whole evening, so just approach me. And thank you very much again.